Hello, and welcome to the Public Insider Series. I'm Casey Farm. I'm the Director of Alumni Relations for the College of Public Health and Human Sciences at the Oregon State University Alumni Association, and you're your host for the series. In tonight's episode, we take a deeper dive on the environmental risks that affect children, and frankly adults, uh, the health outcomes associated with the exposure in those environmental risks, and college's new Aspire Center is working to reverse those trends. Tonight's featured panelists are Molly Kyle, Meg McDonald, and Perry Heistead. Molly Kyle is a professor and environmental epidemiologist in the College of Public Health and Human Sciences and received her doctorate in environmental health from the Harvard School of Public Health. Her primary work is to understand the health impacts related to early life exposure to chemical contaminants. Molly has worked in Bangladesh to examine the effect of early life exposure to metals on children's health, and she's worked with Native American tribes to investigate air quality and chemical contamination in fur foods. Megan McDonald is Professor of Kinesiology, the Early Childhood Research Core Director at the Halley E for Children uh, for Children and Families, and the OSU Impact for Life Faculty Scholar within the College of Public Health and Human Sciences. She earned her doctorate from the University of Michigan in 2011 and worked to achieve her vision by conducting high quality research, teaching, and outreach focused on youthful activity for all people. Her work has been supported by the National Institute of Health and the U.S. Department of Education's Office of Special Education and has been featured in many publications, including U.S. News and World Report, The Hill, and the Los Angeles Times. Perry Heistad is an associate professor in the college and leads the Spatial Health Lab at OSU, which examines the connections between place and human health and well-being. He received his doctorate in epidemiology from the University of British Columbia, and his research focuses broadly on environmental exposure, assessment, and epidemiology with applications to air pollution, healthy built environments, and climate resilience. Our webcast is hosted by the OSU Alumni Association in collaboration with the OSU Foundation and the College of Public Health and Human Sciences. Following the panelists' presentation this evening, we'll have about 25, 30 minutes for questions and answers. So get those ready to go. If you look now at the bottom of your screen, you will find a Q&A button. You are welcome to type questions throughout the talk, even when they're doing their presentation. And at the end of the presentation, our panelists will answer as many as they can before the end of the episode. I know each of you are eager to hear from tonight's panel, so let's get this episode ready to go. Perry, Molly, and Megan, please turn on your cameras, and the floor is officially yours. Great. Thanks, Casey. So first of all, thank you everyone for, for um, joining live. I see um, blue sky and sun out my window. So um, thanks for, for taking the time to join. Um, Casey, if you go to the next slide, we have a, a fairly short presentation for you today, leaving lots of questions for um, and time for discussion. I'm gonna start us off by introducing air pollution, um, providing some specific context for Oregon in terms of what the sources of air pollution we should be most concerned about. I'm gonna then pass it over to Molly, who's going to look um, specifically at why children are more vulnerable to environmental hazards. And then um, introduce the Aspire Center. And then Megan's gonna take us home in terms of actions that we can take to reduce children's exposure to air pollution, as well as ensuring that these actions are inclusive and include all children um, for promoting health and well-being. Next slide. So May is Clean Air Month, um, so this webinar is well-timed. Um, I think that was due to good planning rather than good luck. Um, Casey, if you go to the next slide. So the goal of Clean Air Month, as well as webinars such as this, um, really to me have four main components. The first is really to focus attention on air pollution. And so how does air pollution impact individuals' health? community's health, as well as planetary health. The second part is to enhance public understanding and how individual behaviors can reduce air pollution sources as well as air pollution exposures. 
The next one is to showcase that a cleaner air future is both possible and desirable. And then finally, to demonstrate that large scale support for, uh, for clean air is really needed to change the systems that will lead to reductions in air pollution emissions, exposures, and health impacts. And so this last point is really key. We can only do so much with our individual behaviors, and it's really these structures and systems that need to change to reduce overall um, air pollution. Next slide. So a lot of my research examines how air pollution impacts human health. And so this examines a, a broad range of outcomes from cardiovascular disease to respiratory disease to adverse birth outcomes. And the, the research, research on air pollution has really evolved and followed a similar path to what we've seen with tobacco smoking and, and health effects research. So we started off looking at impacts on the respiratory system um, and then quickly found out that these impacts were really um, systematic in terms of they affected all organs and outcomes in the body. And so now it is actually really hard to find a health outcome that is not associated with tobacco smoke or similarly with outdoor air pollution. And so later in the talk, we're gonna expand a little bit on the health, um, health outcomes that we're most concerned about for, um, for children. Next slide. So the good news is that in Oregon, we generally have good outdoor air pollution. And so many of you have probably seen one of these maps. This is the purple air interface showing um, the air quality index. This was taken, I think, yesterday. Most of the locations are green, showing good, low outdoor, um, primarily fine particulate matter. But we do see some hot spots. And so I'm really going to focus on new sources that are emerging in Oregon that we need to be concerned about for outdoor air pollution, as well as these really local scale sources that um, might be having an impact on specific communities, but aren't influencing the overall sort of general um, outdoor air pollution levels. Next slide. So wildfires is really the big one. Um, the graph on the left shows the acres burned in the Pacific Northwest from 2010 to 2022. Uh, if you were in Oregon, I'm sure you remember the wildfires during 2022 in the fall. And so this map is showing that uh, purple air monitors from September 11th in 2020. During this time, I was doing research um, actually in India and China, and these levels were orders of magnitude higher than what we're, we were um, seeing there. And so during, um, during this wildfire event, I had lots of air pollution monitors. I set them out up outside my house, inside my house. Um, I ran indoor HEPA filters. I closed the, the HVAC um, ducts. And the most I could reduce indoor levels was around 60% of the outdoor concentrations. And so that to me was really interesting in terms of, of the limits of behavioral or interventions to reduce environmental exposures. And we could talk more about those later um, in the webinar. Next slide. So we are really focused in the Aspire Center on children's environmental health. This map shows the locations of around 2,000 public and private K-12 schools in Oregon, with the red areas highlighting um, wildfire smoke sensitive areas. So this is to wildfire smoke, but also to the impacts of prescribed burning, which is going to become more important as we sort of move forward um, to try to reduce these large, really intense, dangerous wildfires. And so schools really present an, um, an opportunity to reduce children's exposure in an area where they spend the majority of their day, and often cases the HVAC or indoor air quality is not as good as it could be. And so that's an area that we're really trying to focus on within the Aspire Center. Next slide. Traffic air pollution is another one of these sources that is important, and it's really important, especially for people who live or work or go to school really close to a major road. And so most of the monitoring indicates that the majority of, of air pollution sort of um, degrades near background levels at around 500 meters from one of these major roads. 
And so those are the areas that we're most concerned about. Um, and we know that if we reduce the volume of vehicles or we change the type of vehicles on the road, we're going to see a very dramatic decrease in those air pollution levels. And so this is just an example of showing um, the reductions in air pollution that occurred during COVID-19. And so this is looking at NO2 primarily driven by a reduction in vehicles on the road. Do you go to the next slide? So this is data that uh, was from a, a DEQ monitor that was near the I-5 in Portland. And we see the same trend. So we see this reduction in black carbon levels when um, there was around a 46% decrease in traffic volume on these roads. Next slide. The other source that we need to be concerned about in terms of its local impact is industrial sources. So in Oregon, we have um, just over 3,000 air quality uh, permits that were um, recorded in 2020. And so that is industrial emissions of air pollution. Um, many of you will, will remember the glass factory um, um, air toxics issue that happened uh, back in 2016, I think, um, where there were two um, glass factories operating within the required um, federal regulations but we're still releasing um, large and potentially dangerous levels of um, air toxics. And so this led to a change in, in uh, how we regulate um, air toxics in Oregon in terms of clean air Oregon. And so we can talk a little bit about that as well. Next slide. And so when we think about air pollution, most people think about what is happening outside their home. And so you look outside, if it's really bad, you can see air pollution. Um, and that's what people really associate when, when, we, when you hear the word air pollution. At the same time, we spend 90% of our time indoors. Indoors at home, in school, at work. And on average, air pollution levels in the indoor environment can be two to five times greater than the outdoor environment. And so on average, it's actually more important to think about air pollution that's happening in your home, right, in schools, at work what sources of that air pollution can be and what you can do to reduce your exposure um, when you're inside your home. And so we can talk a little bit about that as well. Next slide. And I think this is over to you, Molly. It is. So thank you, Perry. Uh, and I was going to start to kind of talk about why uh, we focus particularly on children and children's environmental health in the Aspire Center. And really, children are not little adults. Uh, children are much more vulnerable to environmental hazards uh, because of their biology and behavior. So we've got uh, Casey, advance, please. One of the uh, components that makes them more vulnerable is that uh, environmental exposures will begin in utero. Many of the chemicals will happily pass uh, through the placenta. So whatever ROM is being exposed to, so is the developing infant. And uh, next, that infant, uh, the fetus, and going in throughout early childhood, their organ systems are developing. They have more higher metabolic rates, and their just underlying biological detoxification mechanisms are immature. So a toxic insult that happens uh, to a fetus or a young infant uh, is going to pack more of a toxic punch than it will with an adult. And those uh, any damage that is done will then persist throughout the life course. Next. Children also breathe more air. They absorb more food and water proportionally to their body size compared to adults, meaning that they're going to get a higher dose of exposure from the same uh, environment that, they're, that their parents are in. Next. And children have unique behaviors that increase their contact with environment. Uh, they, there's a lot more hand and mouth activities. They tend to play on floors, which bring them into contact with house dust that can contain some of those toxic materials that Perry was talking about in the indoor environment. Uh, they tend to also, uh, when they're riding their bikes or walking uh, their height, just puts them closer to that vehicle exhaust than the taller adults that are walking next to them. So it tends to just put them in greater contact with any kind of hazard that would be in those environments. Next. And most importantly, children are not aware of their environmental hazards. 
So they're not able to control the environment in which they live, play, or go to school. And so it really is up to the adults around them to create environments that are safe for children, recognizing that they are more vulnerable. Next slide. So this is just a simple example, a little math calculation, if you will, to show that that same exposure to air pollution, uh, if you had a room that contained 50 micrograms uh, per cubic meter of fine particulate matter, which is a moderate air quality day, and you had an adult and an infant in it, the infant would inhale four times as more fine particulate matter than the adult. And so it is because uh, they have a faster respiratory rate and they have a smaller body mass. So when you convert that into a dose, the adult would get you know 16 micrograms per kilogram body weight, but that infant is going to get 70 micrograms per kilogram per body weight. So this difference between adults and, and young children uh, is substantial. And yet most of the environmental regulations that we have today are set at environmental health uh, levels. So again, we have to be kind of on the precautionary point of view when we are trying to create environments that are safe for children. Next slide. The purpose of the Aspire Center, which uh, Megan, Perry, and I are all part of, uh, really builds on the fact that there's been 20 years of substantial investment in children's environmental health research here in the United States. It's been funded by the National Institute of Environmental Health Science, and the Environmental Protection Agency. And they have documented over this course of time, many different health outcomes and many different environmental exposures that negatively impact children's health. So because May was Clean Air Month, we decided to pull out air pollution as one of the environmental exposures, but we easily could have done this talk looking at uh, specifically at asthma, uh, pediatric cancer, uh, adverse neurodevelopment, because those are all also tied to environmental exposures. Alternatively, we could have looked at some of those environmental exposures because arsenic is very common in the groundwater here in arsenic, uh, in Oregon and in the Pacific Northwest. We are all exposed to endocrine disrupting chemicals uh, from consumer products, as well as flame retardants uh, in our indoor environments. Lead exposure is still quite common in uh, old drinking water, old paint, um, as well as some industrial sources and hobbies. Uh, we are an agricultural area, so there is a lot of pesticides that are used in our communities. Mercury is very common. Uh, one of the largest Superfund sites that is that because it's a mercury mine is in Cottage Grove, which is just you know down the road here from Corvallis. And then also things like secondhand tobacco smoke. So uh, there are many, many different environmental hazards that are very common here in Oregon uh, that we need to be aware of. And we need to be trying to get uh, evidence-based interventions into practice much more quickly so that we can reduce the burden of environmental uh, hazards on children's health. Next slide. So that gets us to uh, the Aspire Center. So just last year, the National Institute of Environmental Health funded six children environmental health research translation centers and charged them with accelerating the uptake of evidence-informed information to improve children's environmental health. And OSU was lucky enough to be one of the funded centers along with Emory, Johns Hopkins, New York University, University of Pennsylvania, as well as USC. So we have created this consortium across the country uh, to do these different activities. One of them is to facilitate interactions amongst experts, because this is an incredibly interdisciplinary field. While Perry and I are quite similar in the fact that we both have uh, backgrounds in environmental health, we're also quite different. He's very much a spatial health guy. I like to uh, do personalized exposure. Uh, and Megan is in the kinesiology department, uh, a completely different uh, division. And at many universities, we would never work together. But the goal of this is we all care about children's health and well-being. And so we found this common ground. These centers are also about engaging partners to move science into public health and clinical practice. So we have pilot grant programs to develop, test, and implement uh, projects. We also work uh, with close closely with partners and community organizations to get the best information out there uh, where it can be used. 
Our goal is also to synthesize and translate the existing children's environmental health research so that people are more broadly aware of it, which is kind of one of our purposes here tonight. Uh, we want to test and implement new tools and methods to try to get interventions and prevention strategies in place. And as I mentioned, we're an incredibly collaborative group. So not only within our own center here at Oregon, but also with the centers across the country. For instance, uh, Emory University, their undergraduate uh, group, did a whole health promotion message for a uh, campaign for us uh, to increase knowledge about uh, wildfire smoke prevention that could be used in schools. Next slide, please. So the Aspire Center, uh, our mission is to facilitate the uptake of evidence-formed in uh, interventions that reduce harmful environmental exposures where children live, play, and go to school. Our center in particular is using the expertise that we have here in our college, and we're focusing on shaping behaviors, and in particular, the behaviors of adults, because we're responsible for the children's environments and shape behaviors so that we can mitigate harmful environmental exposures at different developmental stages. And we are housed within the Halley Ford Center for Healthy Children and Families, which is here on camp in the Corvallis campus. Next slide. And this is Megan's Park. Thanks all. Um, thanks Molly for passing it on to me. So it's important that, you know, we're using all of this interdisciplinary work, but now it's time to really find some solutions. So um, Perry and Molly have just shared a lot of information around like uh, air pollution, but also how this ultimately impacts children. Um, so there's a really practical side to this too that we're going to chat about. Next slide, please, Casey. So how do you know when to stay inside and how do you know when to go outside and what decisions to make? This impacts all of us, of course, and we've all learned today that this has an exponential impact on children. So the good news is that there are tools out there that can help us generally make these decisions. Um, this website that you see up on the screen, airnow.gov, is one tool. So when you open the website, you input your zip code, city, or state. And it provides an interactive map with various indicators to let you know how the air quality is. Um, so it's color coded, it has additional information about the air quality, um, and it can just really share with you and help you ultimately make some informed decisions in terms of going outside. Technology in this case is pretty amazing. Um, in some cases, air quality indicators are also linked to weather apps on our phones um, or devices, I might say. I know that I certainly rely on my weather app uh, much more so than I did even 10 to 15 years ago. Um, sometimes, just sometimes, I catch myself checking my weather app before I actually look out the window, which seems which seems a little bit backwards, and we'll come back to that in a second. Um, all right, next slide, please, Casey. So to that end, we don't always want to rely solely on our devices. Air quality can change really quickly. And it's also important in this case to use common sense too, such as local visibility scales. So on a clear day, take a look at the vantage points around where you live, work, go to school and play, um, and consider markers that help you indicate distance. If you can't see a point that's under a mile away, the air quality is very unhealthy, and in some cases may be hazardous. Um, Casey, you can actually go on to the next slide for this. If you can't see under three miles, the air quality is unhealthy for everyone, um, including young children. If you can't see under five miles, the air quality is unhealthy for young children. So it's really important to have both of these technical and non-technical indicators um, to make decisions. This is important for all of us as we're considering decisions for ourselves. But today is really about children. And we know that in this case, they're a lot more vulnerable um, as uh, Molly shared with us too. So this is especially important um, for those of us who, um, who have responsibilities for children, like preschool teachers, elementary and high school teachers, as well as coaches, as coaches and of course, parents um, and guardians of young children and children as well. So while it might in initially feel inconvenient to cancel practice or activity that's scheduled to be outside, um, its effects will be beneficial in the long term. All right, we are going to go to the next slide. 
Okay. So like many of us on this call, I love the outdoor sides where I try to spend a lot of my time. However, it's really important during days of poor air quality to come up with alternatives. Um, and I think this can be really tricky when there are things that are scheduled in our day or activities that we that are part of our routine that we do outside. And those are really important routines for our physical activity, um, which impacts other aspects of our life as well. So um, thinking about this, it's also really important to consider alternative practices and alternative physical activity practices inside. In some spaces, we have alternative spaces. So in many schools, there are gymnasium spaces that are available or other large indoor spaces, which might be able to be repurposed on some days or when the space isn't being used for things like physical education or maybe if it's uh, something like a cafeteria or a stage um, that's not being used for another educational event. So consider moving practices inside or consider alternative indoor activities for some of these events. One concept that has been gaining a lot of attention in the field of physical activity is this idea of classroom-based physical activity breaks. They've been around for a while, um, uh, but they are gaining a lot of attention as we also start to simultaneously look at some declines that we see for children in physical activity. So these are short breaks um, where children move around. Moving can happen at a student's desk, beside it, or in the space where general class activities are taking place. And these are packaged breaks, but also they're really kind of um, breaks to just kind of break things up and get people moving. So an activity break in this case might be like, hey, we've been chatting for a while. Everyone stand up. Let's do a couple jumping jacks. Let's sit back down and refocus on the task at hand. So one classroom-based physical activity break, um, and this can be adapted for various grade levels as well. So from preschool all the way to high school um, for adults too. But one classroom-based physical activity break is BIPA 2.0. Um, so this is um, something that has been packaged. It's evidence-based and it's offered through OSU Extension Services. It's a great resource for teachers. Um, and of course, one that's uh, been created by our own extension faculty. Next slide, please. All right. So I think we are coming up to our time um, for this webcast. And we're really looking forward to taking questions from the group. We really want to thank all of our collaborators on this project, um, the, our Aspire Leadership Group. Many of the folks are pictured here, and uh, the funding mechanism has already come up. But a big thank you to the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences for funding this project and really thinking um, about the translation um, for a lot of the work that we're doing, and also, of course, to our own College of Public Health and Human Sciences. Thank you. Thanks, guys. That's fantastic. Um, I, I'll give you a, each moment to kind of just, again, catch your breath. But, you know, one of the first things that I kind of want to talk about, um, uh, Perry, you had mentioned um, turning down your HVAC system. And I think that's a really kind of Im important one. And I know, Megan, um, you can touch on this as well. You know, since a lot of air pollution seems to be happening in the home, uh, would upgrading a home's HVAC system really help? Is that hard to do? Also, how do you shut down your HVAC system? So like any and all, we'll start off with some HVAC related questions and, you know, Megan, Perry, either one of you can go ahead and kick us off. Perry, do you want to do this first part and then I'll add to my story? Sure. Nothing like getting people excited talking like HVAC. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it was, and so so I was running my HVAC, but you closed the the fresh air vent, and so basically um, you're you're not pulling fresh air from outside into your HVAC system, um, and ideally you would have um, sort of a MERV eleven or thirteen um, filter on your on your furnace to to help clean the air. Um, that that definitely helped, and so sealing up your house, closing windows, doors. Um, but when pollution levels are really high, that still is not enough to sort of fully clean your house. And that's where you can use portable air cleaners. Um, and so those typically clean one room. So if you put it in a living room area, even that is going to struggle to sort of clean air, air levels when they're really, really high. And so we had one running in our room and in our kids' room in terms of trying to, to reduce the air concentrations where we're sleeping. Um, but Megan, I know you had uh, uh, some personal experience of buying a new HVAC system and how that went. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, this is a fun one. Um, I think I was coming home from walking the dog uh, Christmas Eve, kind of late. Stores were all about to close, um, and I had a text message from my partner to stop at the store and buy some uh, space heaters. And ultimately, our, our furnace died uh, Christmas Eve, twenty twenty two. It wasn't too cold at that time, so we were very lucky. But um, it was also a chance to really reevaluate what was what was going to go in, and rather than um, replacing with a furnace, uh, how we were going to replace that system now that it was time. So I think this is also a chance to talk about updates. So we did we replaced it with a heat pump, um, which I'm thrilled about for the coming uh, warmer days uh, where we live in Oregon. But also we're able to um, simultaneously look at the HVAC system too, and um, the filters that are associated with it. So. You know, if it's not something that you've done or it's something that you, you're thinking about, if these moments pop up where it's time to replace a system, um, it might be something to really consider in making those those decisions too. And I would just add too that after a wildfire smoke event, um, it does intrude into your house, as Perry was mentioning. And so just recognizing that you kind of need to clean your house after it. Uh, that those particles will get into the house dust. It will settle onto your floor. And so knowing how to clean up, uh, using damp mopping and damp dusting is actually a proven way to reduce children's exposures to those chemicals that are get bound to that house dust, especially if you have little ones um, that are crawling around and the little rug rats uh, on the floor. So it is kind of thinking about the whole system. And also knowing your HVAC system ahead of time, because when the smoke hits, you want to be able to turn it off right away and not try to fumble around with your system. So it's worth uh, now in the month of May before things get crazy uh, to take a look at your HVAC system and get friendly with it. I would say the same goes for air purifiers. I don't know if anyone tried to buy an air purifier during COVID or during wildfire season. <laughs> they were in, in short supply. Um, so just again, if you, if you can afford one, buying them ahead of time. Um, and there are some really innovative policies in Oregon. So if you're, um, Medicaid or Medicare and you have a pre-existing condition, you can now apply to get a free, uh, portable air cleaner and sometimes air conditioning. Um, and so that's another opportunity, um, to sort of, uh, plan ahead and, and try to prevent exposures before these things happen. Perry, you, you you got ahead of me, which I always love that you're just that that one step ahead. Because I was going to ask about those kind of secondary air purifiers. You know, personally, I have a couple. Um, you know, are are there particular ones? I know you're you know you're your any kind of recommendations would just be one from really um, your standpoint, not any kind of compensation on the back ends, but just any anything that you would recommend. And also, Molly, and I know we've had previous conversations about um, doctors can write prescriptions for certain things that people might not know about it because Paris sort of talked about the Medicare, Medicaid. So I'd love to get um, for the both of you and Megan, if you have something else really on this topic about, especially um, if you can, if it's if it's tough to go out there and buy one, there seems to be other ways and like what are really the best ones? Yeah, so um, there's a really big range in terms of what is out there for portable air cleaners. Um, you can spend anywhere from, from 50 to $75 to a thousand dollars. Um, most of them work really, really well. Um, and so I would say just do some quick, some quick Googling to see if you can find some reviews. Um, blue air is one that, that I've used before that works really well. It's sort of, um, in the 200 to $300 range. Um, and then there's IQ air, which is sort of the top of the line. It filters down to 0 0.03 microns, and and so it is definitely sort of the more medical grade air filtration. Um, and so a lot of people use that if um, they have severe allergies, um, or if um, or if they're they're really concerned about reducing the particle level in their house. And I would also say uh, one of the things to avoid is that there are air filters out there that are also uh, generate ozone and they sell them under the idea that these are disinfecting your air because ozone is actually a very potent disinfectant. It is also one of those primary air toxics that Perry was talking about. So you don't want one that's going to generate ozone in your home. You're trying to clean your air, not make it worse. So avoid the ones that have ozone in them, and you will see them on the market. I don't know why they're allowed, but they are. 
Um, and also the other thing is, is kind of do a little bit of research and actually the EPA has a quite nice, uh, it's somewhat technical, but it's a nice guideline on how to purchase an air purifier for your home. And one of the things that it'll tell you is get the right size air purifier for the room that it's going to be in. Because I think that's where you get the most benefit is when you have the correct size for the room. So you don't need to necessarily purify your whole house because that gets much more expensive. Mm -hmm. But if you're going to be sleeping for eight hours, like by all means, emphasize your bedroom. So figure out, you know, take the area, you know, length times width and figure out the area of that room and then make sure that you're buying an air purifier that can handle that volume. Um, and the EPA guidance really does kind of walk you through that. So it's easy to find with Google um, or if not, uh, you can always spam Perry. He's easy to find out there if the email. I was going to say Molly through this. Right? <laughs> <laughs> <Are you sure? laughs> um, Megan, you had talked a little bit about running um, physical education activities indoors. Um, whether it's at, at home or even schools, should phys ed be running indoors during wildfire events? Yeah, so I think um, similar to some of the high tech and the low tech um, visibility indicators that we talked about are air quality indicators. Um, I think it's really important for teachers and schools to be following guidance around that. So um, when there are events or when the air quality is poor, then absolutely um, students should be inside doing their physical education classes. And I think, um, you know, at, the, at this time, schools are starting to make some decisions about HVAC systems too. And, you know, those are things to sort of be aware of uh, and in tune with, with your local communities and possibly to advocate for um, within the buildings too. Um, so yes, they can, they can have it inside uh, and that that is, um, that's appropriate. Um, and making those decisions, I think, I think I mentioned in the presentation, but it can feel like maybe we're missing out on something um, by not going outside for a day or two during certain events. But it is really important to just think about the long-term impacts of making some of these decisions and, and adapting appropriately um, to have activities inside. From outside to inside, Molly, this is something that I like to talk to you about, and I'm, I'm really um, happy that we get to talk about it tonight. Um, people do focus on wildfire events here on, on the West Coast. Um, for those of our friends who are not watching on the West Coast and somewhere else, I'm sure that's becoming more of an issue where they're at because even some of our West Coast wildfires are going across the country, across, across the globe, so it's becoming more, uh, um, more really um, well-known for those who are not even here, but inside. Let's talk about inside. Uh, consumer product and pesticides, things that, you know, we maybe use to clean or use to treat or whatever to all the to furniture. There's a lot of different ways and things that maybe people don't really think about the chemicals that they're really bringing in. Um, so alternatives are out there, things that you're really seeing. And, and maybe, again, because we like to be very solutions-based, action-based here from the Public Health Insider, things that they can do, easy fixes, things of that nature. Yeah, so especially if you have a little ones or somebody in your house that has asthma or COPD or a respiratory condition, some of the, there's a lot of products that you should just really avoid, in my opinion, and evidence would support that, including things like air fresheners, um, and they're sold a lot. Uh, it's not just a pretty smell. Those are volatile organic compounds that can be very irritating to the lungs, and you don't really think about it. So everything from uh, the air fresheners that you might spot treat a, a stinky room with to those uh, ambiance infusing chemicals, uh, really think twice, actually. Uh, those kind of things are just very common uh, and they do have health effects, uh, especially if you have an occupation where you're a cleaner uh, and coming into contact with those kind of materials over and over again, there is a lot of data to support that that is having negative health effects. So think about that. Um, think about the chemicals in your home and where you store them. So completely a practical thing. Uh, OSU does have the National Pesticide Information Center. Uh, we're kind of the nation's hotline for pesticide, pesticide usage and, and poison control. Think about where you are storing those and make sure that they're out of reach of children. Most of us keep it, you know, kind of under the sink and that's not a safe place for it. So one of the things that was noticed in the pandemic when small children were staying home more 
is unfortunately there were a lot more unintended poisonings because kids were getting into things. So that's something that we can do and we can kind of take the uh, opinion that it's spring cleaning. Uh, so maybe take a look and try to get some of those really toxic products out of your house. You do want to dispose of them properly. And so uh, there are hazardous waste pickup dates in every community. Um, you can easily find that by contacting your solid waste distributor. And usually it's on their website when they do those collections. And take advantage of getting that stuff out of your home. Um, things like consumer products and flame retardant, some of that's harder to avoid. Some of the chemicals that are baked into it. Um, which is why it is actually important to do research and think about some of those systems uh, that Perry was mentioning. And there is, for some of these chemicals, only so much an individual can do. And so it is about advocating for uh, rules, regulations, and policies that are designed to take into account the unique risks of children's health. So we did have a chemical reform at the federal level to the Toxic Substance uh, Control Act that did take start started to go in the right direction. It did make some uh, accommodations for children's risks, but it hasn't gone far enough. So there is quite a few of us that are also kind of still working at the policy level, trying to make sure that our rules are protective of the most vulnerable. Perry, is there anything you want to add to that, maybe either of you? No. Oh. All right. Um, maybe follow up, Molly, because uh, we, as you talked about, Exposures and outcomes, you know, exposure to a lot of these household chemicals um, and these consumer products, you know, I, as you talked about, uh, much, you know, kids are much more at risk than adults. Some of the outcomes that were really seen in children and in adults are similar, different, and, and how does that really affect them across their lifespan? Yeah, so there's some chemicals that are in uh, our consumer products, uh, the phthalates, for instance, which are an endocrine disrupting chemical, uh, meaning that it does, they're subtle, but they subtly affect your hormone and your endocrine system. So that can manifest itself in many different ways at different stages in your life. Uh, it's associated with some fertility issues as well as, you know, increasing the risk of cancers later on in life. Um, in those endocrine sensitive tissues, breast cancer, testicular cancer, um, things that you want to try to avoid. So taking that back to action is use fragrance free products because it's the phthalate that's in those products that helps to carry and preserve the fragrance. So you can still use a product, but just pick the unscented version, things like that. Um, with young children, it can also kind of exacerbate, uh, there's thoughts that it exacerbates uh, some of the asthmas and the allergens that we're seeing as well. So at different stages in your life, you see things manifest uh, differently. And part of that is the dose, the duration, um, as well as the sensitive life stage that the person is at. And I don't know, Perry, if you want to talk about how air pollution kind of is known to affect the lifespan, because uh, that's a pretty good example. Yeah, no, I, and this is where, I mean, there are thousands and thousands of, of air pollution studies that have linked different types of exposures to different health outcomes. Um, and, and there really is sort of solid evidence for this impact across the life course. And so uh, exposure during pregnancy and how that results in potentially adverse birth outcomes and how that then impacts sort of your future risk for chronic related diseases. Um, and so a lot of times when we're talking about sort of environmental exposures and health effects, we can get sort of bogged down into like the level of evidence and is it this type of, of pollution or um, this type of exposure. And for me, we really know a lot now in terms of, of the general impacts of air pollution to health, where the focus should really be on taking action. Um, and so how do we reduce exposures? How do we reduce those sources and how do we take action to um, to try to change these systems. Um, and so even though I do a lot of air pollution epidemiology, I think we know enough to act. Um, and so that's really, that's really what I was excited about with the Aspire Center, where we're, we're trying to translate and get what we know works out into the community, um, to people who could actually use this advice, right? Use these, um, um, HEPA filters to reduce their exposure, for example. So. Let's let's springboard off that, Perry. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the Aspire Center and what each of you think 
are some of the most uh, important remaining research that needs to be done around here, uh, pollution and health. Then again, how center is, is reeling about in taking all um, different disciplines and coming together and again, being active oriented and looking at both the and long term and I know we if we focus a lot as you shot with the different hubs on Oregon but really how this affect uh, individuals here at home across the state and worldwide who wants to go first <laughs> so I'll go ahead and go first um I think and actually I'm going to still make it thunder because what I the goal of the Aspire Center is really to uh, help people understand that there is evidence of this. And so to try to shape people's behaviors. And that's a hard one for environmental hazards because oftentimes they're really common. We encounter them all the time. Uh, so we tend to discount how uh, significant they actually can be. Or they're absolutely invisible, um, even though uh, they can come back and harm you. Uh, and thinking of arsenic in drinking water, for instance, which is uh, a big part of my own research portfolio. You know, it's invisible. Uh, you can't taste it. You can't smell it. Uh, you have to actually send your water out to a lab to measure it. Um, and it could be very high. Uh, but you can also treat it by putting a, a reverse osmosis system on your sink. You don't need to dig a new well. So part of what we're trying to do with the Aspire is uh, get people to recognize the environmental hazards that we have that are very common here in Oregon and also help people learn those accessible, actionable, um, accurate information that they can do to help to mitigate their own exposure and the exposure of the children uh, that are in and around their lives or that they're responsible for. Because you don't need to always go to extremes to do this. Um, being able to know how to check your local air quality. It's as easy as putting it, oh, it doesn't show up on the screen, but you know, you can just put it in your phone and if it's a bad air quality day, maybe don't run outside, go into an indoor environment where the air will be cleaner and do your exercise indoors. That's good practice. Being able to clean up after a catastrophic air pollution event or wildfire smoke knowing how to handle your HVAC system, know that you're prepared so that you can make your house kind of a cleaner space. That's really important. And it's something that everybody can do. So it's kind of helping people navigate the information because you have a lot of information out there, but it's really diffuse. Uh, you hear it from so many different ways um, that people start to distrust sources or things like that. So we're really trying to make ourselves a trusted source of just accurate, accessible information really take a page out of the land grant institution. And if I could add on to that, I mean, we could probably spend a whole webcast talking about the team at the Aspire Center. And we have that picture and thank you at the end of the presentation. But, you know, as introduced as I and I am a professor in kinesiology. So questions about like, well, like, why are you working in this area of environmental health? But the reality is that the team that we have put together, we all have these unique contributions that we can answer and act on some of these much bigger research questions. And I think, um, and translate that, like Molly said, into action. And um, it's been really fascinating, I think, to see what we've been able to do in a relatively short period of time because we're really honing in on some of those strengths um, from our team members as well. So I think it's going to be exciting to see what comes forward. Um, I think there are many other webcast presentations we could do related to the center as well, but just my additional two cents. But if you're thinking about, you know, to go to Megan, where do the athletic trainers and the coaches learn uh, how to be that career? The kinesiology department. So let's put a little bit of air pollution uh, in that curriculum so that they know what to do when they're in charge of athletic training and in charge of schools. So we have this ability to cross pollinate um, information into the different disciplines, uh, which is really unique here at OSU. Uh, it's such a collaborative environment. I forgot what the original question was, but I think. <laughs> so, I mean, I will, so in the Aspire Center, one thing that um, I'm really excited about is how do we, well, I like data, I like new technology. And so how do we, 
how do we use these new tools and resources to better translate information and better target that information for who needs it the most in terms of vulnerable populations, um, areas that might have highest exposure. And so we're, we're doing some really innovative um, um, sort of projects in that area. One of them, Andrew Larkin, is using social media data to try to better understand sort of perceptions and attitudes and behaviors that lead to children's exposure and um, and how people are actually dealing with those in their everyday life. And so that's just an example of a data set that really has never been used in sort of environmental health research before, um, but it's billions of observations from people living their life. And so how do we use that type of information to better understand and sort of translate this type of information out? Yeah, we have a an advocacy related question from our audience um, talking about you know referencing uh, Perry, you know your your statement on thousands of studies on products that produce air contaminants and pollution. They're they're wondering why we don't have more policies that prevent these products from being placed on the market. Are policymakers aware of this type of science? Is that one of the goals outcomes of the Fire Center? I know when we talk about advocacy, you know that's always a little bit of a sticky and tricky situations. Uh, I'm all of the description up to you, but yeah, again, is that maybe one of the reasons why the Spires there's also come together is to help policymakers make better informed decisions, state, uh, Oregon. Definitely. Um, and I'll take, uh, outdoor air pollution and I'll leave the consumer products to you, Molly. Um, but yeah, I would say that, so, um, the clean air act in the U S has been extremely successful in regulating air pollution sources and reducing levels over the last 30 years. And so when we look at um, NO2, for example, it's gone down by around 70% in the last 25 years. Um, during that same period, we've seen population growth, right? Um, economic productivity, and unfortunately, just the amount people are driving increase. So that decrease is really driven by technologies that have made vehicles more efficient and reduced tailpipe emissions. Um, so I would say that that's actually an example of, of sort of a major success where we have been able to regulate um, these these sources at the and at the same time making sort of the economy um, still grow. Um, and so a big a big area of research now is sort of how low do we need to regulate? And there's a lot of research looking at low levels of air pollution. And do we still see associations with ad, um, adverse health outcomes? And unfortunately, most of the research um, actually does see this. And so even once we get down to low levels, um, even say, for example, at five to six to eight micrograms per cubic meter for five particles, we still see these impacts on cardiovascular disease, premature mortality, um, COPD. And so there is going to, we're sort of at this point where um, how low can we regulate and what's the cost of doing that? And so thinking through sort of different different ways of, of getting at that issue, I think is going to be um, something we're going to have to grapple with over the next five and 10 years. And Molly, I'll let you handle uh, consumer products. Yeah. Well, I would say um, you're right. Head of advocacy does have kind of a, uh, a feeling about it, right? <laughs> some people feel really strongly about it. Some people uh, are concerned about it. I'm a scientist at the end of the day, and I will follow the body of evidence. So I do science-based advocacy, and I do science-based policy information, plus the research that I do, um, as does Perry and, and Megan's as well. The science that we produce does get trickled into um, environmental regulations that run this country. Perry's data is used to help to evaluate the new PM 2.5 standard, for instance, that is uh, being pro was just promulgated, right? My work with arsenic has gone into informing what safe drinking water should be with arsenic. So uh, we have these other sides of our, our career, our, our job here, uh, that does go into creating environmental policy. That being said, it takes it's a slow road to get science into policy, um, usually taking on average kind of about 17, 20 years to do that. And there are centers within our consortium of these children's environmental health centers that are very much focused on pushing on those kind of larger policy level uh, systems. 
why we are investing though in this research translation and why we kind of took a sharp turn with the Aspire Center to focus on shaping people's behavior is uh, we're taking the gamble that people will do the right thing when we give them the right information and we give them a clear path and a clear reason and that that is going to happen quicker than the 17, 20 years it takes to get something through, uh, you know, review panels and scientific consortiums and eventually get enacted into law. So we're kind of taking that gamble with our center here. Um, and part of our job, though, is to help people navigate this information, know that it is important, know that there are things people can do, um, and give them clear paths of action that fit into everybody's different lifestyles. So it's a it is a challenge. Um, but there's plenty of evidence uh, to support some of these things. And, and in the indoor environment, that is people's kingdoms. You, you can put anything in your home <laughs> that you want. So how to help people make uh, decisions that will protect children's environmental health is kind of at the forefront of our mind. Uh, and we're kind of taking opportunities as they present. I would say that the Aspire Center right now, we do have a kind of a full push ahead, um, focusing on schools, daycares, and places like that where kids spend the most time. Um, because we think that that's going to be the bigger bang for the buck. And teachers need support. Janitors need support. You know, like the people that are making the day-to-day -day decisions when they have so much else to do um, need kind of help uh, and good guidance and actionable information uh, to do the right thing when, uh, when they have these things to do. So we're in the process. We are just a year old. So we're working on it. More to come. Yeah. Before I get to the last question for each one, each one of you, um, we're another quick question from the audience. Um, one of our audience members is curious about learning more about environmental studies and pollution, or where should they go? Yeah, there are a ton of resources and websites out there. One of the things that we are trying to do at the Aspire Center is pull together information so that it does become a little more of a one-stop shop for trusted information. Because as the moment, uh, it's kind of hard to do. You can hit the primary literature and everything else. But I would say, if you want the high-level overview, there is that NIEHS EPA report that summarizes the 20 years of research that I had in the slide. So we can easily share that link with folks. It's a publicly available document. It's kind of technical, but it also does, I think, a very good job of distilling the technical information into why it's important what you can do about it, and um, where the exposures are kind of coming from. So I would highly recommend maybe that's the place to start is that uh, report on children's environmental health. Thanks, Molly. Uh, last one for all three of you, and I'll just let you know, Megan, I'm going to come to probably you first. Uh, last 30 seconds from each one of you about really what you want people to take away from tonight's talk. Again, we're all about action items here, and, and maybe one of the things you incorporate in that is change behaviors because you got to change your behaviors before things really start to change. And so uh, really what you want people to take away kind of going forward and the things that they can do both in the short term and long term. Yeah, I think one takeaway that I would really encourage for audiences with uh, personally, but also in their communities um, and in their broader communities is that it doesn't have to be a major shift or these are that we have, um, you know, tangible targeted solutions that can be built into things that are already ongoing. So Molly talked, we talked a little bit about some of the examples that came up, but for example, if you're in a community and you're training volunteer coaches, take 10 minutes, five minutes, to talk about air quality and visible indicators for those coaches um, to help make decisions for children that are playing on that team. Um, so I think that would be my one takeaway is that it's not, there's a lot of information. It's hard to digest um, and, and, and kind of wrap your head around, but that the solutions are actually um, quite simple. We just have to act on them. Yeah, I'm going to take a slightly different tact in the sense that um, it is May. It is clean air month. Um, and it is before wildfire season hits. And wildfire season is a seasonal event these days. So take a moment now to prepare. Uh, get to know your HVAC system. Realize that you can buy um, filters that go in your HVAC system and that they have a MERV rating, M-E-R-B. The typical one that gets put in is a MERV 6. 
that's great for like dust. But when wildfires come in, you might want to pull that out and put a MERV 11, which is more of a HEPA filter in there. That's what I do. So when wildfire smoke comes, I shut off the intake valves. I put in better filters um, and it helps make my house a clean room. But I can do that because I planned ahead. Uh, and that is uh, MERV filters are usually about $11 a piece. So it's something that you can do that's really low cost uh, and helps improve the indoor air quality. And if you have them and you've you've done a little bit of work now, uh, it'll you'll it'll become second nature when those events hit. I think my my take home message might be, um, and this is always a challenge with environmental health risk, is that just because you can't see it or smell it or taste it doesn't mean it's not there. And so Molly Molly talked about this with arsenic and water. Um, the same goes for air pollution until you're at these really, really high concentrations. So um, you might not see fine particles coming off your gas stove or ultra fine particles near um, uh, a major highway. And so just because you can't see something doesn't mean it's not there. And um, and so sort of changing your mentality in terms of, yes, like you can test for these things, you can get information on them, and then you can act on them. There are very sort of simple steps that you can do to reduce your exposure and health risk. Yeah. All right. Right of time for this evening. Oh yeah. No, go ahead, Molly. One more thing. I have to say, if you have a gas stove, use your exhaust fan, for example, always. Love it. Like that last little, little, little bit, little tidbit at the end. Uh, now we're out of time for the evening, uh, but I want to recognize and give a big thank you to Molly and Perry and Ben for their informative and engaging talk for answering as many of our audience's questions as they could in our period of time. A big thank you to all three of you. The, the three of us always talk about there is so much more. We could do episode after episode after episode on just the things that each one of them are talking about. So I really appreciate them uh, trying to distill as much as uh, research and work that they do into tonight's episode. If you'd like to learn more about the research coming out of the Aspire Center within the College of Public Health and Human Sciences, along with other resources, hey, look at that. There's been a slide up there for you to look at. Please check out these various sites that we have up now on your screen for more information. We have one more episode of the spring season of the Public Health Insider exactly two weeks from tonight on Tuesday, May 23rd at 5.30 p.m. For that episode, you'll learn more about the research that's being done on current type 2 diabetes medication actually how we can prevent the onset of diabetes for one in three Americans who are pre-diabetic and how it's also shedding light on the importance of the mitochondria and its impact on metabolic health. You won't want to miss that one. To register for the upcoming episode or to rewatch and share any episode from the entire Public Health Insider series, including tonight, that will be up here in a couple days, please visit the series site that you see right there at fororegonstate.org slash PHI. Lastly, each attendee will receive an email from me tomorrow that will I was like more for you to connect with OSU and a brief survey about tonight's event. I know we get a lot of surveys, but I tell you what, I really appreciate it if you could take a moment to fill it out so that I can continue and the rest of uh, my wonderful clients can continue to mute the programming from the college and the alumni association that you are interested in. That's what we're here for. Um, I look forward to hosting each of you again 